see a lot of the things were spruced up out in the front. Uh, I think uh, even like Kevin Otto came on Friday because he couldn't be here on Saturday and did all the mulching out in the beds. And uh, we got a lot more stuff to do around here. So if you didn't get a chance to come, let Pastor Pete know and he'll find you something to, uh, to work on around here. We've got a lot of things that still need to be done. And uh, so uh, he would love to get you involved in that. Wanted to remind you once again, we have uh, started a new app here at the church. It's called Church Center. And uh, They came last night to our youth uh, rally event that we had, and then they're here today. They're going to come, and they're going to do some dramas for us this morning. And let's just give them a hand as they come this morning and minister to us. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is great to be here. I do want to say thanks to Pastor for allowing us to do this. Uh, Pastor Becca, Pastor Corey for... Pastor Brooks, it was great last night, we had a great time, and so good to be with you this morning. We love, we travel all across the country, uh, but it's good to be right down the road from Cleveland uh, here in Hickson with you guys this morning. We're going to be in Florida next week, uh, South Carolina in a couple weeks, and so uh, we go all over the place, but good to be with you this morning. Uh, as he said, we, we're the traveling drama team from Lee. Uh, I think a few people this morning said, uh, looking forward to hearing you sing. Uh, you would not look forward to that if that's what they did, so... Uh, I'm saving you, uh, saving them some embarrassment. We're going to promise today. So uh, we're going to do a couple funny things for you, a couple serious, and then Pastor, Pastor Brooks will come up and uh, share the word. And so, like I said, these first couple are funny. Uh, feel free to laugh. We encourage you to laugh. They will do better if you laugh at what they do. Uh, if you don't, it's going to be a long couple minutes for you guys. So uh, laugh a little bit. Uh, we believe the Lord has a sense of humor, and so uh, we write everything we do. Uh, a lot of this is based on personal experience or just things that uh, we understand people go through as Christians. And so while we want you to laugh a little bit, 
we ultimately want you to think about your relationship with the Lord, what you're going through. We're going to cover a variety of topics, and so hopefully something that is said today uh, will speak to you. And so uh, coming to introduce this first skit is Grace. Come on up here, Grace. Hi. Um, like Michael said, my name is Grace, and I want to tell you all a little bit about me. Um, something that I try to do every day is read my Bible. And when I first started doing this, it started off pretty well, and I was keeping up with it. And then after a while, life set in, I got really busy, and I kind of just stopped. And there have been days where I've gone without reading it, and I started to beat myself up. I started to not feel like I was a very good Christian. But I came to the realization that this life as a Christian, it's not about how good we are. It's not about all the things that we do. It's all about that relationship with Jesus. And that's what this first thing is about. It kind of looks at how, as Christians, we create these checklists when, um, like I said, this life is just all about living life like Jesus and living life with him. So I hope you guys enjoy this first thing called How to Be a Christian. Be a Christian, featuring Jackson Rader. Accepting Christ. For Jackson, it was the best day of his life. Better than graduating high school. Better than his wedding day. And yes, even better than when the Tennessee Vols won the national championship in 1998. Everyone has been congratulating him and showing him so much love. Go on, everyone. Show him some love. Give him a hand. All right, now stop. Stop. I said stop. <clears throat> Thank you. Now that the celebrating is done, we'll have to get down to the business of being a Christian. Are you ready? First things first, picking out your Bible. The Bible will guide you through all the tricky situations that living life as a Christian will present to you. So you'll need to find one that you can understand. Fortunately, there are a variety for you to choose from. There's the KJV, that is the King James Version, and the NIV, the New International Version, ASV, CEV, GNV, ISV, NLT, ESV, BLT, TNT, LMNOP, and E equals MC squared. Whether you choose the King James Version's, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, or the Messages Version, you can fly, love Jesus, matters not, so long as you read it every single day. The next thing you'll need to know is how to pray. Posture is important here, so it's better to start out on your knees. Very good. Now, bow your head. Close your eyes. No peeking. That's better. You're a natural. Now, clasp your hands together. Well, that's... Yeah, that'll work. Now, there are a few key words that you should always include in your prayer. Father. No, not Daddy God. Mercy, Thou, Hedge of Protection, Rebuke, Enemy, Blessings, Jesus, Leaders, Overseas, Healing, and Amen. You can't go wrong. Choosing a church will also be important. There are the Methodist, Presbyterians, Catholic, the non-denominational denomination, and okay, who led the Baptist in here? No, no, I'm only kidding. And of course, let's not forget the Assembly of God. And the best part is, Jackson, you can choose whichever church you want. Uh-uh-uh. <clears throat> uh. Wonderful! Now that you've chosen a church, remember that you'll need to pay your tithes. Oh, come on now, Jackson. It's for the church. Well, let's not be greedy. Wonderful! You've done a fine job, and you're well on your way. And if you haven't found out already, I don't have all the answers. Just do your best and try to live as Christ lived. You can't miss that way. And that's all for today, folks. Join us next week at the same time for How to Run an Effective Nursery featuring Jackson Rader. No babies. I'm good. Thank you.
Hey guys, I'm Allie Grace, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about myself and introducing this next skit. So, a couple years ago, when I was looking at colleges, I had basically everything planned out. I'm one of those girls that basically has my whole life on a Pinterest board, so I know exactly what I want to happen, exactly when I want it to happen. But, you know, I was talking to my mom, and I was talking to my guidance counselors and all these people trying to figure out what college I wanted to go to, where I wanted to go, how I wanted to make that happen. And I sat down with my mom, and I was like, Mom, I think I know what I want. She's like, okay, well, make sure that you're praying about it. Be faithful in prayer. I was like, yeah, okay, I can do that. So I would go, and I would pray about it, and I'd say, God, this is what I want. Thank you. <laughs> and I would leave. And I did that for a long time, and I started to get kind of frustrated because as the process continued, things weren't going the way that I thought they should go. I wasn't getting the scholarships that I needed. I wasn't, nothing looked on track at all. And so I went back into my room, and I said, God, this is what I want. Please bless it. Thank you. And I left. <laughs> and it happened over and over and over again. And I was getting so, so frustrated. I found myself in tears and I went to my mom and I said, mom, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make this work. And she asked me, she said, Allie Grace, are you talking or are you listening? And I said, I think I'm listening, but okay, I'll go try again, I guess. So I went back and I said, God, this is what I want. And I, I didn't end it. I just kind of left it open-ended. And he said, oh, good, you're, you're going to listen to me. That's great. And he kind of gave me a rundown of just, he settled my heart in some places and things started to work out. But it wasn't until I actually opened my ears and opened my heart that he got to bless those. But then on the other hand, we have a story like Jonah where he heard God. Actually, he heard God very well. And he heard exactly what he was saying. And he still was like, yeah thanks, that's great. I'm actually going to go do this instead. That works way better. Obviously, if you know the story, it didn't work out that way because he didn't listen. He heard God, but he didn't listen. And so in this next skit, you're going to see something a lot like that where we don't know how to listen sometimes, but all God wants us to do is just listen to what he's saying. So I hope you enjoy this next skit called, Are You Ready to Listen? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the doors you've opened for me. Well, of course, my son. I'm so proud of all that you've accomplished. I mean, I can't believe I'm about to preach my, fir preach my first sermon tomorrow at Grace Point Assembly of God. I know. It's really exciting. I'm really excited for this opportunity. Oh, God, it's going to be great because mm -hmm. you have given me a great sermon oh. all about a Christian fulfilling his or her duty. See, that would be a great sermon, but here's the thing. I really think you should God, preach on something else. I know. I know the congregation is going to receive all that you have for them. Are you sure that that's what I have for them? Because I think that's what you have for them. That's not what. I think I see what you're doing here. Uh huh. <laughs> you are opening the door for me to get a full time position there. Oh, well, see, actually, no. I'm calling you into full time ministry elsewhere. This is God, just one stepping stone. Working on the... there would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Pastor Terry is loaded. <laughs> that's true. So I know. That love offering will be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Uh, amen, <laughs> I, amen. But I if would you have could to just... deal with Pastor Corey, but that's uh, fine. That's fine. I can handle that's that. That's true, Pastor Corey. Yeah. But see, here's the thing. If you could just listen to me for a second, you'd know that actually... Yeah. God, I know. <sighs> I've been doing a lot of praying, a lot of studying, a lot mm -hmm. of work. Yeah? And there's one thing I really needed to do listen. right now. Yes, you need to listen to I me. need my sleep. I gotta go to bed. You know, it's late, mm -hmm. and this face does not come naturally. Uh, yeah, I know. Gotta get that beauty rest. Yeah, you do <laughs> so, need it. But if you could just shh, thank you, hold God. on for just a second. You're always looking out for me. Hey. Amen. <laughs> At least he said that. It's not gonna go well, guys. So how'd it go? Yeah. God. Yes. You must think you're really funny, don't you? I mean, I did invent the concept of humor. I made the platypus. There was this whole TV show. Why with... didn't you tell me that I was going to be ministering to the children's church? <laughs> <laughs> if only someone had warned you about that. I couldn't even get past the title of my sermon because they laughed whenever I said, A Christian's Duty. <laughs> 
there's a double meaning. I don't even get it. <laughs> See, listen, one's a job and the other's a job, if you know what I mean. I just don't get it. Luckily, I was able to talk to pastor afterwards and persuade him into giving me an unpaid internship. <laughs> no thanks to you. Oh, no thanks to me now, really? I mean, God, I, I know you're all-knowing and everything, but your plan... What were you thinking? Oh, so it's my plan I now. I mean, Yeah, well, it really did go because you're not listening to me. I mean, what do you want from me here? Uh, I'm trying to dedicate my life to you, mm. my entire life as service to you, and nothing's working out. What do you want? Listen. All I want from you is for you to listen. The plans I have for you are far greater than anything you could possibly imagine. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. But none of them are going to happen if you keep getting in the way of yourself and aren't willing to listen to what I have. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, you're right. My plans are to give you hope. I just feel that shh, shh. Hope and a future, all right? So, are you ready to listen? You can respond. I'm ready to listen. <laughs> Christian's duty, classic. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Emily. I'm going to introduce this last funny thing that we're going to do for you guys. So um, this skit reminds me of a mission trip that I go on to Mexico every about every year. And the director of the trip has something that he calls the red stool. And so what this red stool is that no matter where we're at, if it be at the orphanage or at you know the grocery store or the hotel or whatever, if he places the red stool in front of you, you have to stand on it and give your testimony. And the first time I ever went on this trip, I was just 13 years old, and I'd grown up as a pastor's kid. I was like, I don't have anything to say. I don't have anything worth listening to. And I remember some people were, like, practicing theirs, and they were saying all these, like, crazy stories of what God had redeemed them from and brought them through. And I just sat there, and I was terrified. Like, I did not make eye contact with the director any, like, just was scared that he was ever going to call on me. And, but throughout the, the trips, people started getting up there and just talking about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God and um, how Christ died for us and resurrected for us so that we can have eternal life. And I think that that is the greatest story and that is the, the best testimony and we all have that testimony. And so this is just kind of a funny way of looking at that. And we're not trying to poke fun at any testimonies. We're just trying to show that this is that we all have the same testimony. And so I hope you enjoy this next thing called Christians Anonymous. Hey everybody and welcome back to another sessions of Christians Anonymous. I'm so <laughs> glad to see you all made it again, but oh, looks like we have a new face. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Emily. Hi, so, Emily. Emily. <laughs> Hi, Emily. And? Oh, well, it's Emily's first time, so we won't make her go first. And I know that most of you know how this goes, but since Emily's here, I'll go over it again. This, this right here, it's a, it's your safe place yeah. where brothers and we sisters can come together through Christ and share what the Lord has brought you through. You start by saying your name and then your testimony, but do not speak oh, unless you have the sharing ball because we want to respect what everyone has to say and what the good Lord has done for him. Amen. 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 Sure. Amen. Okay. Yeah. Who wants to go first? Bro, I'm I'll get go. Over Me? Me? I'll go. I'll go. Okay. Hi, I'm Sydney. What's up, Hi, Sid? Sydney. Hi, Sydney. Hi. Oh. Hi. And six years ago, the Lord delivered me from a life of addiction to drugs and alcohol, and I have been sober ever since. Isn't that good? So good. I know it is. I know it is. Yeah, Jackson, you go. Hi, I'm Jackson. Hi, Hi Jackson. Jackson. And the Lord delivered me from the streets. Fire me up, bro. I said that the Lord delivered me from the streets. That's it. That's all you need to know. Trust me. Yeah, but like, what does that mean? It means I was in a gang, all right? I stole. I murdered. I even killed. Bro, isn't that what but thanks to God's grace, I'm done with all that. I'm out. That's okay. it, all right? That's it. That's all you How need to know. How are you not in jail? Did I mention the part okay. about God's I'm grace? Oh, Emily. Emily, I know you're new, but Jackson has a strong ball. Oh. 
Oh, no, 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 Jackson. Jackson, mm. ooh, let's not hurt our friends today. No, 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 Jackson. What? You wanna do our favorite thing? Your favorite thing? Our favorite thing, I know. <laughs> let's do it, let's do it on the count of three. One, two, three. God's, God's grace. grace. Have a seat, have a seat, thank you. How about you, go? <laughs> What's up, you guys? I'm Owen. Hi, Hi Owen. Owen. Hi, Owen. <laughs> Chill, bro. And about four years ago, bro, God delivered me from my first shark attack, bro. Your first shark attack? You've been in two? <laughs> no, nah, bro, I've been in three. So anyways, I'm out there with I the bros. I remember my at. first shark attack bro, like it was yesterday. Okay. I'm telling you, it's Jackson. not that big of a... Jackson, hey. Oh, no, 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 no. That's a hard friends. Oh, no, no, no. Do we need to say our favorite thing again? No. No? Okay, okay, but remember when you had the sharing ball? Regrettably. Owen? Yeah, but Owen has it now, okay? Oh. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So anyways, I'm out there shredding some gnarly waves with the bros, right? Then this shark pulls up like Jaws 2 style, dunna, 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 and I was like, heck no, bro. I'm dipping back to shore, no cap. So I hop on my board and I'm swimming as fast as I can. I'm a little overweight, so I get a little no. tired. And no. I lean over on my board and I look up in the sky and there's an airplane with a banner and it says, Jesus loves you. Oh. Bro, and that's when I knew, bro, that I want to give my heart and my mind to the one true king, bro. Just want to lay this. Lay this. Like sweet. casting crowns, bro. That's so good. That's so good, you know. Yeah. And the other two shark attacks. <laughs> Rededications, bro. Chill, you had to reel me back in real quick. You know? right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Big old shark. God bless me. Chills. Yeah, For sure. Chills every single it's time. the best one. Oh, yeah, bro. I, I don't know about that. But you know what? Matt. Yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, you're the only Matt here. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know what? It's your turn. Go ahead and go. All right, okay. pass the ball. Heads up, bro. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, bro, he's angry. He's angry. He murdered him. Oh, it's okay. Oh. Jackson. Hey, ja ooh, Jackson, you know what? It's time to do our favorite thing again. Mm, let's yeah. do it. Yes, you ready? One, two, three. God's, God's grace. grace. Have a seat. Hi. I'm Matt. Hi, so, Matt. Matt. Hi, Matt. And everyone I've ever loved is dead. Oh. Hold up. That has to be an exaggeration. There is no way that's true. No, it's true. My pet fish, Gilligan. Mm. My pet rock, Steve. Mm. Mm. My imaginary friend, also named Steve. Mm. Mufasa from The Lion King. Okay, that was really sad. <laughs> and my last Christians Anonymous group. Okay, Wait. don't love that. Um, there has to be some childhood friend or something. They're all dead. Yeah, come on, bro. Listen up. Yeah, I, uh, I, I had a tough time making friends as a kid. I wonder why. Jackson. What? I, I could never go to any of the birthday parties. You weren't invited. Why would you say that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I could never go because, because I was always at all of the funerals. <laughs> this guy's crying. That's okay. Safe place. Sit. Okay, just, just you know, console him. Yeah, start. console him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can do it. Uh, there, there, buddy. Uh, I don't think I killed any of them. Hey, can we speed this up? I really got a wave to kids, so can we hurry? Oh, well, hey, we cannot leave without giving Emily a I'm chance okay. to share. It's okay. Oh, okay. Yep, 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 you will. Matt, Matt, oh, thank you so much for sharing. That touched me, it really, really did. Yeah, but now it's Emily's chance to share, so go on and pass on the ball. I, I like the ball. Oh, I'm so sorry, but go ahead and pass it on over. Come on, that's how it works. Pass it on over. Yes, you can do it. Thank okay. you. Emily, mm -hmm. whenever you are ready. Now. Hi, I'm Emily. Hi, Emily. Emily. Hi, Emily. And the Lord delivered me from... This is going to be good. Um, <clears throat> he delivered me from... Um, Emily, remember this. This right here. It's your 
It's your safe place, and it helps to share your story. Yeah, Emily, I feel totes better after sharing my story. Okay, that's just the thing. You all have these amazing, incredible, and honestly kind of weird stories. I grew up in the church. I've never had to deal with drugs or murder. I've never been in a shark attack, and <laughs> I've never lost a loved one. I deal with boring things like insecurities or being on my phone too much. I can't compete with your stories. But, bro, why would you even want to? I mean, I know we're all walking miracles in here and all, especially me, but you're definitely one of them. Yeah, the bro is right. (laughs) Jesus saved you too. He gave us eternal life. Death is not an issue for us. Praise God. That's the best testimony, and we all have that. Emily, I think I speak for everyone here when I say I'm so glad you came, and I hope you leave encouraged by other testimonies, but also your own. Uh, thanks, guys. Emily, you seem like a pretty cool girl. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> Dear Lord, I hope not. Yeah. All right, we're going to transition to some serious stuff, but I wanted to take a moment and introduce the entire team to you, since you won't get to hear from all of them individually as they do intros. Uh, down there, who's on the end down there? Sid? Hey, Sid, wave. Sid is from Birmingham, Alabama. She is a advertising major. She's a sophomore. Uh, Owen is from Bay Manette, Alabama. Uh, we don't know much about him. We met him at a truck, truck stop, and he said he could do drama, so he got on the van with us. Um, now, Owen's a pastoral ministry major. He's a senior. Uh, Jackson is from right up the road at Terrible Tennessee, he is an advertising major. He's a junior. Uh, Emily's a junior. Uh, she's from Tifton, Georgia, math education major. Uh, Matt is from South Carolina. He's a pastoral ministry major. Uh, Grace is a freshman from Largo, Florida. She's a pastoral ministry major. So we got two pastoral majors. And Owen, you're, you can pray for people too, right? Okay, yeah. If you need something, go see Matt or Grace. That was what I would recommend. Um, Owen out. I'm sorry, dude. I'm for that. Uh, A.G., you heard from her, she is also from South Carolina. Uh, she is a psychology major. And Clay, you guessed it, he's from South Carolina as well, uh, and he is a music and worship major. If you don't mind, give them all one big hand. Hey, guys, like Michael said, my name is Jackson. I'm going to be talking about this video you're about to watch. So about a year ago, the world shut down, you know, We all went to our various homes across the states. We got to keep in touch through Zoom. We still had our class time like usual, and it was nice to have the fellowship there, but we wanted to still have the opportunity to do something, to make something. With how hard 2020 was, with all the issues that were happening in the world, we felt like it was time for us to produce something, a good piece of content that really addressed the issues that were going on. So we had this amazing opportunity to collaborate with Kingdom Players, old and new, um, from 2013 all the way to 2020, people who had just gotten on the team. And we got together and we wrote this spoken word that we all filmed in our own homes um, that we edited together to make this beautiful video to talk about different Bible stories and talk about how Jesus calls us to love, how Jesus calls us to love one another, and how we need to live more like Jesus. So I hope you enjoy this video called WWJD. in the sight, yet we have lost our eyes. And are at war with ourselves. At war with the lies. Lies that say black always means danger. Lies that say white always means hope. The Bible says the tongue is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So before we speak, we must drown out the noises. And think about our choices. What part are you called to do? Remember what Jesus said in the book of Luke? To have eternity, we must love God with all our heart. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Regardless of their status or wealth. At what cost do we become insensitive to those whose lives are being lost? Some are sick of hearing about it. Some are sick of living it. Some may not relate. But in our brokenness, we can separate the space. Jesus taught to love, not to hate. To embrace, 
not to erase, to recognize our own ignorance and proceed to educate. Think about the bonds with each other that we could create. He taught that we are sisters and brothers, united under a greater mentality, so that everyone feels pain when anyone falls victim to another fatality, that we may not judge those who look or act different than the usual. A mutual respect that every life is beautiful. It's time we come together. The people united have a voice. The people united will never be divided. The people should matter. And the people should be the priority. No more preconceived misconceptions. We are made in the image of God. Every person carries God's reflection. That is the message. Stop building up resistance. We are imperfect. Who are we to cast the first stone to anyone who seems different? But rather, being a stone catcher should be the blueprint. So answer the call. When a brother needs your hand. And in return, they'll be there when you fall. To help you up and see you through. Remember the good Samaritan in Luke. Will you walk past the man who was beaten in the streets? Robbed of his clothes and left to bleed? Will you be the Pharisee too proud to answer a hurting man's plea? Or will you be the good Samaritan? That without hesitation or judgment, got on his hands and his knees. And saved a man from becoming deceased. It's your voice. To stand up. It's our choice. To be heard. It's my choice. To change. And I choose to love. To love unconditionally. Regardless of how you look, or regardless of your past. Jesus himself walked off the beaten path. So many stories of Jesus we could tell. You'll find one in John 4, the woman at the well. This story isn't one about different skin color. Jesus was a Jew, wanting to heal a wounded Samaritan daughter. Because even though she wasn't like him, she still needed living water. In Luke 22, instead of condemning a man's sin, Christ healed the soldier that apprehended him. Even if their hurt hurts us. We must love all God's children, even if what is right is actually wrong. Because we don't trade an eye for an eye. We turn the other cheek. Religious leaders told him he was wrong for healing. He didn't care because he was there for the people. He was there for their needs. So my friends, listen to me. We are called to walk as Jesus did. Amongst the crippled, the poor, the diseased, the masses, the widows, the orphans, and everything in between. Do not turn a blind eye because it's convenient. Instead, educate yourselves. Educate others. And most of all, look out for one another. Maybe it's just me, but I think what this world needs is to remember four simple letters. W. W. J. D. Hey, honey, I'm home. Hey, honey, how was your day? It was wonderful. How was yours? It was good. How was work? It was hey, perfect. Mom. Hey, Mom. Hey, Tad. Hey, Sid. Sid. How was your day? It was pretty good. How was practice? It was good, but I missed a couple shots. Well, did you have fun? I did. Then you won. We're so excited about your game next week. Me too. Yep, we're going to head to the gym right after date night. You guys are the best. No, you're the best. I've got dinner ready in the kitchen. Let's go. Okay. Okay, wait, wait. Um, that's, that would be great if that's what we see every day, but it's usually not. Um, so we're going to try this in a different way. Hey, honey, I'm home. Did you close the garage door? Uh, yeah, yeah, I got it. Um, hey, did you get a chance to talk to the roofer about the estimate? It's going to be pretty hard to add that on top of the mortgage and the car payment. But I... Seriously? What? Uh, nothing. Well? What? I, I don't know. Aren't you going to ask me how work was or something? Yeah, sure. How was work? Good. Good. When was the last time... I actually meant that. When was the last time my wife asked me how I was doing and I actually told her? Or that I miss her when I'm at work? I miss her when I get home. I told her that it hurts me when she chooses her phone or her friends over me, over her family. 
it feels like I'm mourning. Like I'm mourning my wife. Mourning the way that things used to be. The way that things should be. I just wanted to notice. I wanted to realize that our family we're falling apart. Good. Uh, that's good. I've been meaning to tell you, the girls and I are going to take our last week of vacation and go to Florida next week. Are, are you kidding? Is that not okay? No. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. Actually, uh, you go off and have fun, and I'll just be late to work again because I'm dropping our daughter off at school. But that's fine. You go have fun. It's all good. <laughs> good. You hear that? We're doing good. I'm so thankful for my little family. I mean, this is as good as it gets. I have a husband who loves me. And my daughter, she's great, doing so good. She's a straight-A student, captain of the basketball team, biochemistry tutor, worship leader, God seeker. I know, practically a textbook example of perfection. I don't know what I'm going to do when she graduates, but I guess I get a glimpse of that every Saturday night when she's at a friend's house and I'm left at home with him. You know how that is. Husbands are husbands. Nag, 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 and fight, fight, fight. You start picking up the extra shifts at work because you don't want to be at home with them. You start hanging with your friends a little more and going on dates a little less because you start wanting to be with them over your family. But um, I guess that's life. That's marriage, the way it's supposed to be, the way it's supposed to go. You know what? No, it, it's not okay. It's not all good. I'm sick of how you think you can do whatever you want while I'm stuck picking up all the slack in this family. Are you kidding me? I sacrificed so much for this family. <laughs> Mom, Dad, I just wanted to remind you guys about this Tuesday's game. It determines if we go to regionals or not, so you guys should come. I'm sorry, honey. Your mother's not going to be able to make that because she's going to be living it up in Florida. Don't bring her into this. <laughs> You're not going to be there? I've had this trip planned for weeks. You know I'd be there if I could. Um, anyways, how are you? I hate how people ask that. How they act like they care. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. And it goes around in circles like that for several seconds, and they don't even realize you've already answered their question like five times because they're not really listening. It's just something people say because it's something they say. Well, that and to make themselves feel good. Like they're doing some noble act of charity for asking you. Asking your daughter how her day was. I wonder what would happen if I told them. If I actually told my parents the truth told them that I feel like I'm being crushed under this weight to be the best, told them that I feel like I'm the only one keeping their marriage together, and told them that sometimes I wish they would go ahead and get the divorce because I'm just, I'm sick of this, told them that I'm scared. I'm scared to tell them. I wish I could just tell them. So you're good? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? So that's pretty heavy, um, and not everybody deals with this. You know, I, I personally don't. I came from a really good family, um, but we all deal with this idea of hiding our pain and not wanting to let people in to our life. You know, even as Christians. Uh, but the Bible tells us to do something different. Um, Exodus 17: um, Israel is fighting uh, Amalek and his people, and the way that God tells them to win this fight is He sends out Joshua. And there's Moses, this guy named Hur, and Aaron. Um, and Moses goes up to the top of this mountain. And for them to win the fight, he has to lift up the staff of Moses, which represents the power of God. And so the first thing that we see that he does is lift up the staff, lift up the power of God. And a lot of us do do this. You know, like we, The first thing we do sometimes whenever we're going through something is we lift up the power of God. We say, God, I need your help. You know, That's what church people do. That's what makes us different from in the world. But then what we forget is that Moses couldn't hold that up by himself. He couldn't do it. And it's not that we needed to help God. 
Like the power was in him. That's not, that's not where we're lacking. But what happens in this story is Moses can't lift this staff by himself. And whenever he lowers it, Israel fails. And so he has to keep this up all day. He has to keep this staff up all day, the power of God up all day. And so he has Aaron and he has her. And what they do is they take his arms and they help him lift this staff. They, they sit him down on a stone and they hold up his arms all day until sunset, until Israel wins. And we need these people in our life. We need people to surround us, not because God isn't all powerful and all sovereign and all knowing, but because we are weak and we need other people. We, we can't just hide it like these people do. You know, it's, it's gonna make life worse. That doesn't make sense. We are the body of Christ. What do you do when you get a cut on your arm? What happens? Your other arm reaches over and grabs it. And we need these people and we have them. The proof is right here. You have pastors, you have the church, you have the discipleship that happens here, you have these classes that are going on. This is where we find our strength. You know, God is powerful. He is, I'm not, I'm not denying that at all. But we need each other. And that's how God has made us to function. So we hope you get that from that skit. Okay, so I'm going to be introducing this next skit. And in, in Matthew chapter 13, there's this analogy that Jesus says. And he says that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field. And when a man found that treasure, he hid it, and then he ran off, sold everything he had joyfully to buy that field. I think that's an amazing analogy of just how much we're supposed to value God. We're supposed to see the kingdom of God and our relationship with Christ as the greatest thing. You know, we see that in Philippians 3, where Paul says, you know, I consider it all rubbish in comparison to how much I love Christ, in comparison to the knowledge of Christ. But I think one thing we're prone to do, we're prone to see this field that is, you know, our relationship with Christ as something that we can make down payments on. As something, okay, I'll just, just maybe I'll just go live it right now, I'll do the rest later. But I think the reason we do that is because we don't really truly understand the value of that field, the value of that treasure. We're supposed to just sell everything and joyfully sell everything and really value our relationship with Christ beyond everything else. So in this next skit, you're going to kind of see that struggle, that struggle between loving God and loving that, our relationship with God but still having desires for other things. But we need to constantly remind ourselves of the amazingness of Christ. So this skit is kind of like an analogy like that. It's going to be two friends talking, but one of them is a Christ figure and just how we're supposed to just value Christ as our friend and as the best thing in our life. So I hope you can enjoy this next skit and really evaluate your own life. It's called Not Enough. Oh, sounds fun. <laughs> Not this again. No, really, just look. I've never had that. Yeah, well, neither have I, but I'm still here. You know, you were my first friend. <laughs> really? No? Yeah. I mean, what made you want to talk to me in the first place? Well, nothing really. <laughs> no, I just, I just mean like you weren't exactly friend material, but I don't know. I didn't just want to leave you there. Well, you know I appreciate that, or at least now you do, but I'm ready now for bigger things. Bigger things? You know what I mean. No, honestly, I don't know what you mean by bigger things. Come on. The people, right? The friends, the fun, the that. Be careful. That's not all it's cracked up to be. Look, I'm here. It, isn't this what you want for me in the first place? To be happy? Well, yeah, I want you happy, but not like that. That'll only give you what you think you want, Grace. Come on. You just... One person. And that's not enough? No, I mean that... You mean that I'm not enough? You know, I think I'm going to go over there. No, I think you should stay here. Why do you do that? Do what? You get like this, you start acting like my mother. I'm just trying to protect you. That's not you. your job. It's not... 
No, no one there ever really liked me either. That's because you're you, but I'm not that. I'm good enough now. I'm not that weird, depressed, helpless kid anymore. And if we're going to keep being friends, you need to accept that I'm better now and I'm moving on to better things. But I can't, I'm your friend, Grace. I love you. I can't just stand around and watch you just throw everything away for stupidity, especially when I know that there's something so much better out there. This is not life. This is not living. I mean, aren't we missing out? You just get so judgmental. But those people, they would never do that. Sure. You were there for me when I needed you, so thanks for that, I guess. But I'm not always going to need you like I did. I love you, and thanks for what you've done, but just accept this. But you're not going to accept me. How is that right? Are you not listening to me? Did you, did you not hear me say that I love you? I heard you, but it's half-hearted. It's not real. It's real. <laughs> then why don't you act like it? Why do you continue to choose them over me every single time? Why do I have to? Why are you making me choose between you and them? Because being friends with me takes a little bit more effort than that. It can't just be one-sided all the time. Shut up. No, I can't. Don't you get it? Listen, every time you cry, I'm there. With every heartbreak, I'm right by your side. I provide you food when your parents can't provide it. I defend you at school when you're too tired from taking hit after hit after hit. But you don't care. No, I do. <laughs> you're too embarrassed to even be seen with me. So you choose and you choose, and you choose, and you choose wrong. You don't understand why. Grace, I'm your friend. But honestly, I'm not sure if you've ever been mine. You know, you're right, and I'll do better. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Of course I forgive you. Hey, what if we both went over there? No, I think we should just sit here and talk. Look, you're my friend. Just trust me. We'll just hang out later. Okay. I'll be here. Just a little while longer. Oh, I'm Sid. In growing up, my dad traveled for work. So a typical week, I would be really lucky if I got to see him maybe on Sunday, but I'd usually see him like once a month. He just was always go, go, go to different cities. And so although that was my normal, it still was pretty hard. You know, there's a lot of moments and big events and even small events that you want your father to be there with you. So, you know, whether it was a sporting event or my first day or even graduation, it wasn't always practical for him to get to be there. And so the important thing for me to remember that my mom even always reminded me was that he's one phone call away. He was one text message away. And although he wasn't physically there with me, he still loved me just as much as if he was there with me. He was simply providing for me. And so I think that's the coolest thing, that it also reflects how our Father's love is for us. He's not physically standing right here where I can touch him but that doesn't mean he's not right here with me the whole time. In the Bible, it says that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And in Romans 8, it talks about how neither life nor death, nor angels nor demons, nothing can separate you from that love and that we are more than conquerors through him. And so in this skit, you're gonna see a military family and how the family is struggling because the father isn't right there with him, but it reflects our father's love for us. And so enjoy this next skit called More Than Conquerors. Hey, Dad. I haven't heard from you in a while. 
I guess you've been keeping busy over there. Life has been kind of crazy over here, too. Different kind of battle, of course. Anyway, I've got so much homework. The other day, I was working on math, and I almost cried into my Cheerios. I know, that's stupid, but no one else is really listening around here. So you get all the fabulous details of my life. Sorry if you get tired of them, but I just don't want you to miss out on life here. I want you to know everything, especially how much I love you, and I always will, and I do, but if I'm being honest, I don't know how to love you all the time since, since you left. left. The only way I know how to show you is through writing letters like this. I guess that's all you can do sometimes, is write a letter. So all you might see is a big paragraph when you get this. Just know that it means I'm doing my I best to love, love you. you. I, I miss, miss you, Dad. Dad. Sid, I'm, I'm telling you right now, Dad is not reading that. Yes, he is. He's still our dad. He's just not here. That's <laughs> okay. it. Whatever. Hey, Sid, I'm going to go grab dinner. Do you want to go? Yeah, but I'm still working on this, so. You can just finish it when we get back. Okay. Clay, you want to go? Um, uh, no, I'll hang back here this time. Hey, Dad. I'm sorry I haven't written in a while. It's been busy. Friends at school, and Mom's been obsessed about my grades, so homework's been constant. I've just not, I've not had time. Dad. Dad, you've got to come back soon. I'm tired of being the only guy at home. I, I, I don't know if I can do this whole military family thing. I'm not mad. I swear, I'm just... Well, okay, well, I, I don't know what I am, but... I just feel like you're missing out on everything that's happening in my life. I, I, I don't have friends at school. And... That girl I was dating, she's gone, and, and you're gone, and, and I'm left with all this responsibility I didn't ask for with, with Sid and with Mom. And <laughs> you're just never there. You weren't there. I understand people leave. So honestly, it didn't surprise me when you did. I just never thought you would. Don't get me wrong, I'm so honored to be your son. I hear all about the amazing things you've been doing and the lives you've been changing. I just, I thought you were supposed to be here for me too. And that doesn't feel true right now because you're so far away. I guess my issues aren't important in comparison to all the evil that you've been seeing. So I don't mean to polish stuff in the letter, I miss you. You know I do. I don't want to complain, but it's just so hard right now. Well, the least I can do is say thanks for all the years you did stick around. You were a good dad then. Stay safe out there. Please. I love you. Clay. What you reading? Uh, letters. My kids don't seem to be dealing with the whole military family thing too well. So. Yeah, well don't let them bug you. You got a lot to do out here, and you got to stay focused. Okay. Well, you have a family, then you can give me fatherly advice. So. Hey, all I'm saying is we're fighting a war out here, and you got a lot on your plate. You sure you can handle that extra stress? I mean, no, you're right, but their problems are big to them, so they're big to me, too. All they need is their dad to help try and figure it out. I'll leave it to you. Thanks, man. Clay, Sid, the mail's here, and your dad wrote back. He did? Yeah. He did? My dearest kiddos, I'm not even sure if I can call you children anymore. You're both practically grown up already, but you'll always be my kids. I've read both of your letters and come to the conclusion that you've forgotten, forgotten who, who I am. am. I've 
watched you both grow up. I've sat at the table doing homework with you, Sid, and seen several of your cereal bowls fill up with tears as you struggled over division, then algebra, then geometry. I promise I was there for it all, so don't think for a second I'm not there with you now, even though you can't actually see me anymore. And thank you so much for sharing all your little life details with me, because I may be fighting a war over here, but it's It's for you, sweetie. sweetie. And I will always care about everything you want to tell me. Clay, it's okay to be mad, but you did the right thing by telling me. I can handle a little anger, but I never want you to ignore me when that happens. I know it's hard. Life is sometimes. Especially when you feel abandoned by me or a girl or whatever it is. But you're my son. And remember, that means you're mine. And that's not going to change. I will never leave you. I will never let you down. And I will never stop loving you. Kids, I'm fighting this war so you don't have to when the time comes. So, while I'm away, don't forget who I am. And especially who you are to me. I love you both. More than than you you could could ever know. know. And hey, guess what? In case you forgot, I'm coming back soon. So, get that homework done. Dad. Oh, what did he say? Everything he used to say, I just forgot. Love you, Mom. I love you, too. And I think he left something for you, too. Hey, told you he'd write back. Shut up. Dear Emily, I love and miss you more every single day. Thanks for being there for our kids. They've definitely been under some pressure, but we know they're worried for nothing, right? They're more than conquerors, after all. Let's give them a big hand again. Thank you, Kingdom players. Some awesome, awesome touching dramas today. And... uh, We're just getting started because Brooks Till is now going to come and going to share a word from God with us today. Let's give him a hand as he comes and shares with us. It's a long walk to the top of the stage, ain't it? I was telling Brittany when I came in, I hope I don't fall off the stage today. That would not be good. I don't know if you guys have a forklift around here or anything like that, but... Uh, give it up for the Kingdom players one more time. They were, they, uh, of course, they were, they were with us last night for the youth rally. And, and um, you know, sitting there, I was thinking, you know, I hope my son Griffin, he's three now, he's terrorizing the nursery right now. But, um, you know, I hope he grows up to, to be like these guys right here. I mean, if I, if, if I, can, get, if I can get Griffin to your age... And, 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 and he do something like this, you know, maybe not exactly this. I don't know what he's going to do. But if he can be like, you know, one of these kids, I, I think I would have done my job well. And, uh, and I just think we need to just applaud them one more time. And, and, and I call you kids. You're not kids. You're, you're young men and women. And, and, uh, but, Michael, you've got some good ones, don't you? And uh, most of them. And... Uh, and uh, I just, I, I thank a lot of you, you guys. And so thank you for coming and ministering to us today. And uh, I'm going to try to get this music stand going here. If it falls down, it falls down. But it's good to see you all today. It's good to see my friends, the Surreals here. I, I haven't seen you all in a while. And, and, uh, and we, me and Isaac, we've worked camp together. And we've slept on air mattresses and bunks at times. And, and uh, that's a good thing. You haven't lived until you stay in a room with me on an air mattress or... <laughs> It usually folds up like a taco by the morning. So, <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, uh, it's good to be here. Good to be at Grace Point, and uh, it's good to be with Pastor Terry. D- listen, do you love your pastor today? you got a good pastor. And his better half, you married up. I was telling Michael we married up, and my wife is here, Brittany, and, 
and uh, she is so fine, you know, and uh, and she uh, she is definitely uh, the best part uh, uh, of anything that I do, and uh, she is a speech therapist. She helps people communicate. Kids, she helps kids communicate. How I many? The one of the most important things you could do is communicate. If you can't communicate, you're going to have a hard time. She helps people. She helps these kids communicate, and so. You know, I do ministry in schools, but she's in the school every single day. She's at two middle schools, and she works with them. And, and she comes home and tells me the stories uh, of some of these students. And if you were to go to one of our middle schools and our high schools and find out some of these kids' stories, you would find out that they were some of the most terrific stories you had ever heard in your entire life. And she hasn't been working there long, but... You know, after a, a story or two of her telling me uh, what she's dealing with, it, it, it put really put into perspective what we're doing with Youth Alive and how we're connecting churches with schools. You know, years ago, they, uh, I don't know how else to say this, the church kind of sat back and, and let the world, um, the world's opinion kind of take over, and they, and they stripped prayer right out of our schools. And you know what? One generation tolerates, the next generation embraces. And our, our youth director, Jeremy Austell, he I've heard him say, like, don't knock this generation because you're the one that raised them. How true is that? Don't talk about them when you're the one living in front of them. Uh, I believe this is one of the most important generations that there is. I actually believe that our middle schoolers and our high schoolers, I believe they're the church of today. I really believe it, and and I don't know if you really know what I do. I'm a missionary here to Tennessee, and 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 we do school ministry, and we do, you know, we're, we 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 help kids set uh, set up clubs, and we we do school assemblies, and and we do a lot of program stuff. But these students, they're not a program; they're a prophetic voice in a lost and dying world that needs to know Jesus. And so I I I wonder uh, what we're gonna what we're gonna tolerate. As a church, we live in a we live in a world right now where where uh, where things are uncertain. Uh, we're wearing masks and, and everything's upside down. The last thing we need is for this generation uh, of young people to to see you guys roll over and quit. I, I hate a quitter, and you show me a quitter, and I'll show you a loser. I don't know how else to say it. If you quit, you're going to lose. We can't quit, church, can we? I got a three-year-old back there. He, he busted his head a few nights ago. He's got a big blue line across his forehead right now. He looks like Frankenstein. And uh, we stayed with the Phillips last night, and, and uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm, uh, he slept forever uh, this morning. And I was just watching him sleep this morning, and I thought, man, what is, what is this little guy going to do with his life? So precious, ain't it? What kind of school is he going to walk into? What is church going to look like? And I wonder, what if we motivated these kids to actually plant a church in their school? Boy, wouldn't that be something? That would be a today's church, wouldn't it? Go into the dark place and, and shining a light. And so we're going to talk about something today. We're going to talk about a mountain. And that mountain is called your life. Your life. And what if I told you that there was a mountain with your name on it, and on the other side of that mountain there was a piece of property, a piece of land that has been purchased, that has been bought, that has been set aside since the beginning of time, a view just as far as the eye could see that was yours. And the only way to see it is to climb that mountain and to look over. A view that was between you and him, that only you and him could see. Would you climb? Would you climb? I hope you guys have come ready to climb today. I was, Griffin, he's kind of taken after me, and I was talking about him sleeping. He snores. <laughs> and, you know, I have the body type to snore, all right? All right. I, some people would call it sleep apnea. I just call it eating eating too much. All right, and uh, and so he snores and 
And Brittany woke me up last night, and she said, Brooks, you're snoring too much. Roll over. <laughs> you know? And a few months ago, this is, well, it wasn't a few months ago. It was actually on the 4th of July last year. We were coming home, and Griffin had played all day, and fireworks were going off all over the place as we were on our way home. And, and I could hear Griffin in his car seat behind me. He was asleep. He had probably had 20 Capri Suns that day, and he was just crashing, and he was snoozing, and his little nose is so, so small. His little nostrils, they're just like little pinholes, and I could hear him just snoring. And when I snore, it's annoying to my wife, but when Griffin snores, I, it's the most beautiful thing ever. Because if I can hear him snoring, I know he's breathing, and if I know he's breathing, I know he's living. And it's all right if we breathe hard in this life. That means we're alive. And so I was listening to him snooze, and I told Brittany, I said, he's so sweet, ain't he? And she said, yeah, and she said something that, that really messed me up. And believe it or not, I do think from time to time in, in, this, in this head of mine. And she said, have you ever, have you ever wondered how long Griffin's going to live? That messed me up. I said, I hope he lives to over 100. And I started doing the math, and if Griffin lives to 100, he'll live to the year 2,117. That's a long time from now, ain't it? And there's people who live to 100, and I, and I hope he's one of them. 2,117. Messed me up. Messed me up. What is he going to do if he lives that long? And then I got real sad because when he gets to 80 and 85 and 90 and if he reaches 100, I won't be here to see it. That's a sad part of life, ain't it? That whatever I do in front of him, when I'm gone, that'll be what's left with him. I want to tell you that in this life, whatever you do in this life, when you go out of here, that, whatever you did, that will be your legacy. And if you're a person who lies, you'll be known as a liar. If you're a person who cheats, you'll be known as a cheat. If you're a person who struggled with alcohol, you'll be a person who struggled with alcohol. But if you love the things of God, when you leave, you'll be known as a person who loved the things of God. I started thinking about what it was going to be like, and I started thinking about, like, I need to save more money <laughs> to take care of them. Who's going to take care of them when I'm gone? You think about things. I'm 34 years old. You, I'm thinking about stuff like that now, and I'm thinking, man, I shouldn't have had that honey bun yesterday, you know, and <laughs> I shouldn't have put that extra stick of butter in that macaroni and cheese. And You start thinking about things like that. If I live to 100, I'm going to live to see the year 2086. And some of you, I don't know, some of the math major over here, I don't know why in the world you would do that, but you're a mathlete, so you can, you can get your calculator out. If you live to 100, some of you are closer than I am. What year would that be? This life is a, is a mountain. It's a beast, isn't it? And I want to just talk about it for a few minutes today. If you got your word, you can turn to Mark 3, 13 through 15 and Matthew 28, 16 through 20. I'm going to read from the message today. And that's kind of unusual for somebody preaching a sermon to read from that. But I, 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 don't, I don't want you to read your Bible when you go home. I want you to get involved in your word. Reading sounds boring to me, okay? I'm not a guy that really enjoys reading all that much, but when I get involved in my word and I put myself there, something begins to happen and I, compre I can comprehend it a little, bit, a little bit better. And I want us to get involved in our word this morning for just a few minutes. I'm not going to talk for very long, but I just want us to get involved in it. 
for just a little bit. Mark 3, 13 through 15. We're going to read right there. We're going to read about a mountain. He climbed a mountain and he invited those he wanted with him. They climbed together. He settled on 12 and designated them apostles. The plan was that they would be with him and he would send them out to proclaim the word and give them authority to banish demons. I'm going to read on in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Meanwhile, the 11 disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally, which meant some doubted that it was really him. And Jesus, undeterred, he went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet. Make disciples far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all that I have commanded you. And I'll be with you as you do this, day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. Two instances in the Word. Two moments, and they took place on a mountain. In the first part that I read, I, the, the one thing that, that stands out to me the most as I start reading that is, he climbed a mountain and he invited those he wanted with him. He invited. He gave an invitation. He didn't command them. He didn't demand them. He didn't tell them they had to. He said, I, I love you and I, and I found you, but if you want more, I will be on the mountain. And the invite is on the table. There's more. There's more. And you think about the way Jesus lived his life and everywhere he went, and he was on that mountain, and how many met him on that mountain? Only 12. So we've got to make a choice today. Are we going to be one of the many? Or are we going to be one of the few? Because many of them are out today. They're not in church. Are we going to be one of the many or one of the few? Many are saying, I can't go to church because I don't want to get sick right now. But they'll go to a restaurant and sit for two hours the night before. Am I talking to you today? They don't have a problem going to the store but they won't go to church because they don't want to get sick. you got to make a decision if you're going to be one of the many or one of the few. Do you believe he can, he, can, he can keep something from you or not? Do you believe in the healing power or not? Do you want to follow him or not? There's no in-between. You can't just tiptoe on it and, and be over here. You're either going with him or you're not going at all. He gave an invitation. Twelve met him there. Twelve. Next thing I see in that scripture is the plan was that they would be with him and he would send them out to proclaim the word. That was the plan. So we discovered two things. He gives you an invitation. He wants you to go with him. And then the second thing is because he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your life just as he did for the twelve. Go with him. He invites and he plans. And what's the plan? To proclaim the word and to have authority over a demonic forces. Right? Incredible. And then we go on to the Great Commission. And I find something interesting here. Is that when he appointed them, there was twelve. But when he commissioned them, there was only 11. Which meant one of them quit. We all know who that one was. We all know who the one who fell off was. 12 started. 11 finished. Not everybody is going to finish. 
you're going to get going on this thing and people are going to quit on you. Pastor Terry, you know this, as you pastored, you're going to pastor and people are going to quit on you. Michael, you're, going to, you, you're trying your best here to, to get these kids doing ministry, but along the way, one or two, they may quit. People will flake out on you in a heartbeat. Twelve were appointed. Eleven were commissioned. As I read on, they, when they saw them, it said, some worshipped and then some doubted. They didn't want to risk themselves. And I'm going to let you off the hook today because even when they saw them, they doubted. You're going to have days when you doubt. That's just the way that it is. I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to tell you, over the last year as a missionary, when you get up and you look at the account and some of the money didn't come in that normally comes in, there's some doubts that rise up in you. Well, when you lose your job and the bills keep coming, there's some doubt that rolls in there, isn't it? When the doctor gives you a, gives you a diagnosis that you don't want to hear, there's doubts that start to creep in. Can I tell you something? This life is not fair. I don't even know if fair is a word. I think fair is just something that's been made up. Life is not fair. Life is hard. And there's going to be days you're going to get up and you're going to doubt. And this is where the next part comes in. God authorized them. He commissioned them. And he said, I know you doubt. I've given you the invitation. I want you here. I got a plan for your life. I'm giving you the charge. And I know some of you are doubting. But I want you to get up and I want you to keep going anyway. And this is the part I like because at the end of that, He said, I'll be with you as you do this. When will he be with you? Day after day after day after day to the end of the age. I'll be with you. I want you to go with me. I want you to climb. I've got plans for you. And there's going to be days you're going to doubt. And life's going to be unfair. But I will be there to meet you. And I will walk with you through it. Day after day. After day. After day. To the end. I'm with you. That's the comfort that we have, don't we? It's incredible, ain't it? I wonder if we're going to report to the mountain today. Growing up, I... I told him last night I wasn't going to say when I was little because I've never really been little. But I remember growing up, I had, a, I had my, my bike that I had. I, it, was a, um, it was a red and black bike, and it was bolted together. And when you're a hefty little kid, you know, your bike gets ragged pretty quick, right? And this bike, uh, the, part of the rubber on the handle, was, it was torn off, and, and it had this little foam piece that, you know, on the part that goes between your, between your legs. It, it had a little foam piece so you didn't get hurt. That was ripped off. The spokes were all jacked up. My tires were dry rotted. They stayed flat. My rims were bent. I'd try to jump curbs. When you're a chubby kid, you don't need to be jumping curbs. You need to stay on the asphalt. A smooth ride, you know. My bike was falling apart. I had outgrown my bike. And then, boy, had I outgrown it, right? And I went and I told my dad, I said, Dad, I need a new bike. Bad. And he said, all right. He said, uh, you know, I think he got paid on Thursday afternoons, you know, Fridays or whatever. And he said, Saturday, he said, we're going to go, we'll, we'll, we'll get, go down there and get you a bike. I said, all right. And so in school, we had a little time uh, every day for about 45 minutes. We could go pick out a magazine or whatever and, and read it in class. And, and I remember I'd pick out the Sports Illustrated Kids edition and I would read it and and there was a group of kids in my class. They were the skater kids. And, Michael, you may know what I'm talking about. They used to wear these big jeans called Jinkos. 
don't know if you know what JNCOs are. Isaac, I know you're laughing because you know they're the biggest, ugliest pair of jeans you could ever imagine in your life. And they, and they, and they wore what they called skate shoes. They were the ugliest shoes I've ever seen. They were called airwalks. You know what I'm talking about? Look like pillows. Ugly shoes. But they served a purpose because they helped them skate. They wore chains hanging off of their, their wallet and all that. I guess they were afraid somebody was going to steal their wallet when they're in elementary school. They ain't got no money. And, and, and so I remember being in class, and, and, and I remember I'd be like, man, I need a bike. But they would read these, like, these extreme sports magazines. I, I didn't even know bike riding was actually a sport. Now, I'm be honest with you. I don't think it is. But, but they would read it. And they'd read about skateboards and, and bikes and all that. And so I went over to them, and I said, hey, I'm going to get me a bike. And some kids in my neighborhood, they had bikes that had these, had these pegs off the front and the back. People could ride on it, you know, with them. They could do tricks. <laughs> I'm an overweight kid, and I was thinking I was going to do some tricks on a bike out of my neighborhood. That wasn't going to happen, right? I'd break my ankle. And so anyway, I told them, I said, I need to get this bike. And, they, and, and I said, what kind should I get? And they turned the page, and they said, here's a, here's a bike. It was a BMX bike. I don't know if you've ever heard of a BMX bike. It was red and silver. The thing was incredible. It was like, this is what you need. You need a BMX. I said, all right, where can I get one of them? He said, you know where McDonald's is? I said, that was a dumb question. Yeah, I know where McDonald's is. And there's a bike shop called Cyclist Gate behind McDonald's. I said, okay, I know what you're talking about. He said, you can get a BMX in there. I said, awesome. I said, how much are they? They told me. I was like, that's pretty expensive, you know. Well, if you can't get that, that you can get a Huffy. It's a good little bit of a downgrade, but it's good. You can get you one of them. I said, all right, awesome. Friday night rolls around. I tell my dad, I said, hey, Dad, we're going to get a bike tomorrow? He said, yep, yep, we'll go get it in the morning. I said, awesome. We're going to go to Cycle Escape and get it. And he just looked at me, you know, like he didn't, like he didn't care what I was saying, you know. And Saturday rolls around, and we jump in the truck with Mom and Dad, and we go, and we, we rode right on past Cycle Escape. We didn't go to Cycle Escape. I'm just looking out the window like, there goes Cycle Escape. We pulled into Walmart. <laughs> You know what Walmart is. I said, Dad, I want to go cycle escape. He said, we ain't going to no cycle escape. You got to just know my dad. He ain't politically correct, you know. And he always coughs and sniffs before he says anything. He's like, <coughs> he's like, we ain't going to no, <coughs> we ain't going to no cycle escape. Get something at Walmart. Donnie, that's my dad, right? <laughs> Donnie and Rhonda. That's my mom and dad. Good folks. Pull into Walmart. I said, all right. Well, maybe they have a BMX in Walmart. They didn't. <laughs> all right. We went to the back. All the bikes are on this rack back there. All right. And so I'm like, they ain't got no BMXs. I was like, man. So I found the one that looked the closest to it. And it wasn't a BMX. It was a mongoose. How many of you know what a mongoose is? That's the great value BMX. And some of you know what great value I'm talking about. It's not cinnamon toast crunch. I'm talking about like toasted cinnamon cereal squares, you know. It's kind of like Cinnamon Toast Crunch, but it's not. You know what I mean? Those cinnamon squares, they'll tear your stomach up. You okay? I'm just going to tell you. And, and, and so the mongoose was that version of BMX. It wasn't red and silver. It was orange and gray. All right? There wasn't chrome pegs. They were black. You know? It kind of looked like it, but it wasn't. And I pulled that thing off the rack, and I got on that bike. And I'm telling you, the bike seat was about this big. It looked like a little sliver of pie. And I, I don't want to get graphic with you, but I'm going to tell you, they thought I did a magic trick in that, in that Walmart because the bike seat disappeared. <laughs> it went into the abyss. I'm talking about magic trick, abracadabra. Now you see it, now you don't. The handlebars was up in my chest. I ain't going to get into that, but I need some help in that area as well. And, and I told them last night I, I didn't know I could get anything between my legs, and, <laughs> and, the, and the bike pedals were up in my, in, in my legs. I was too big for that bike. My dad comes around the corner, and he's like, <laughs> boy, you ain't got enough bike. <laughs> Rhonda, come here and look at this. <laughs> dad, moms, they're cracking jokes on me. You too big for that bike. That bike seat's probably still here on the stage with me right now. That is, that's not enough bike. Brittany is so embarrassed right now. I ain't even going to look at you. I mean, you ain't got enough bike. Dad, this is what I want. I want to do tricks. He said, you don't need to be doing no tricks. And I'm sitting there. I'm feeling sorry for myself. 
And all of a sudden I hear, dad brings a bike from the other side around. It was the biggest bike I have ever seen in my life. It looked like the bike that the Wicked Witch rode on Wizard of Oz. Grand, big old granny bike. Big old handlebars, big old plush seat. I thought, I bet that feels good on your lower back, though, you know. And I remember getting on this thing, and I ain't going to lie, it fit me. It didn't look good, but it fit me. And I thought, well, this does feel pretty good. And Dad was like, that's the bike for you. I was like, Dad, this bike is ugly. He said, that's a mountain bike. I said, Dad. He was like, you ain't built for that street bike. You're built for the mountain bike. I said, what are all these hoses coming off here? That's brakes and gears. And I thought, okay. He said, that's the bike for you. And I remember in my neighborhood, we would go out and we would ride bikes with our friends. And my friends, they, you know, they all had BMXs and Huffies and one or two mongooses, you know. And we would go ride bikes. And my friend Marcus, he, he lived up on top of a hill in my neighborhood. And we had this big hill on one side of the neighborhood, and we could never ride our bikes up that hill. It was just too steep. The only ones that could get up that hill were the older kids, the ones who were bigger and stronger and had better bikes, right? And they could go right up to the top. But on top of that hill was Marcus's house, and Marcus had a pool table, and his parents always ordered food from swans. And you know what a swan is? They got some bumping frozen pizza, don't they? Yeah. And we'd go up there, and I'd eat, it, eat their food every afternoon, you know. And I bet his parents wondered where all the food went. But we went there, and they had BB guns, and we just always had a good time. But if we, went up to, if we could go up the hill, we'd be right there, but we couldn't make it up the hill. So we had to go all the way around the back of the neighborhood. It took almost an hour to get there. We didn't get there much. It took too long. We were going to ride bikes that day, and so I, they pull out, and they, they knew I was getting me a new bike, and I had talked it up I was getting me a BMX. And all of a sudden, I come, come out on that big old granny bike. And I come out, and that thing had a water bottle strapped to the middle of it. I had that thing full of ice and fruit punch. <laughs> and I came out in the street, and I water fought. I looked like Lance Armstrong in the Tour de France when I came around on that thing. And they're out there dogging me out. Man, I thought she was going to get a bike. Man, that bike is lame. That's a granny bike. And I was the king of cracking, but they were cracking on me that day. I was like, will not y'all just shut up and let's just go ride some bikes, right? And they're doing their tricks and stuff. You know, I can't even lift my leg. I don't even know why I was thinking I was going to do some tricks. And I'm just out there riding. And they, and they were like, well, what are we going to do? I said, let's go to Marcus's house. And they said, all right. So we took, they took out around the backside of the neighborhood. And I said, no, 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 no. We're going to go up the hill today. We're going to go up the hill. I said, yep. They said, we can't make it up that hill. I said, yeah, but my dad bought me a bike, and he said it could go up a mountain. So I take off, and I go up that mountain of a hill. And I got about halfway up, and my little fat leg, they just start jiggling and shaking. <laughs> little like cottage cheese just jiggling up there. and <laughs> Going up, and I'm like, oh, no. And then I remember some gears, you know, that my dad had told me about. And all of a sudden, I shifted those gears, and... It was easier to pedal, and all of a sudden, I'm at the top of the hill. And I looked down, and all my friends with their, with their trick bikes, they're still down there in the street, and they're trying to make it up the hill. And they're struggling, and some of them's got off the bike, and they're walking it up. Some of them have quit, and they've gone home. And I'm up at the top, and I couldn't wait to go to Marcus's, and some of them were looking at me, and they were like, if Brooks can make it to the top of the hill, I can make it too. And I'm up at the top, and I'm saying, hey, Marcus, pedal. Trey, pedal. Joel, come on. You can make it. You can get here. And not all of them made it, but some of them did. And some of them got to the top, and we went right to Marcus's and got right into that swan. He said, why don't you tell that story? Because some of you, you've been out here in the street, and you've been, been living a life you were never built to live when you were built for the mountain. Did you know that the Father has bought and purchased and equipped you with everything you need to climb the mountain?
You were built for the view. You were built to climb a mountain. Or are you going to be one of the many? Or are you going to be one of the few? Do we have that picture? That mountain right there. Some of you may know what that mountain is. That's El Capitan. I didn't know what El Capitan was. I thought it was a software from a MacBook. Over quarantine, we watched some documentaries, and we watched this documentary called Free Solo. Some of you may have seen it. It's about an American mountain climber named Alex Honnold. He climbed El Capitan. And let me back up just for a second. He, he has climbed it hundreds of times, but the documentary is about one time he climbed it. He free soloed. El Capitan. And some of you say, what, is, what does free solo mean? Well, I just want you to look at how big that mountain is. Thousands of feet high. Those trees at the bottom, some of those are 100 foot tall. That's a big mountain when you compare it to that 100 foot tall. I, I, I can't, I, like I said, guys, I'm doing good to make it out to my mailbox every day to check my mail. He free soloed that. You say, what does that mean? He climbed it with no rope. He's done lost his mind, hasn't he? Walked up to the, how would you like to walk up to the El Capitan and just climb it with no ropes? Look how steep it is. This documentary was about his life. He just didn't come up and climb it overnight. He went and climbed that thing with ropes day after day after day after day. He reported to the base of that mountain. He studied the mountain. He knew where every little nook and cranny was on that mountain. He lived in a van out there at the park, and, 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 and he would get up and he would climb that thing every day. And every day that he, he climbed it, he would come back and he would make notes about what he found out about the mountain that day on the journey. He studied it. He involved some math. He, 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 he wrote everything down. He, he lived the mountain. And people, they told him he was crazy. And I, and I, and I still think he's pretty crazy, you know. And, and, and I was like, man, this guy is crazy. And this was his attitude. He said, they don't know the mountain like I know the mountain. They've never seen the view like I've seen on top of that mountain. They think I'm crazy because they've never done what I've done before. They haven't put in the work that I've put in. They don't know the mountain like I know the mountain. And his attitude was this. If I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. But if I perish, I'm going to perish on the mountain. The people ain't going to understand what you do. Kingdom players, they're not, everybody's not going to understand out in this world what you do up here on this stage. Students, you're going to go to school and you're going to talk about church and you're going to talk about youth rallies and things like that, and they're not going to understand what you do. You older ones, you're going to go to work and you're going to talk about what God is doing in your life. And nobody's, and there might be days where there's nobody that understands what you're talking about. But they're built to climb too. They just don't know it. When I read about and saw about Alex's life climbing that mountain, I found out some things about him. His mom never told, her, told him that she loved him. His dad died prematurely when he was a young man. He was picked on a lot. Circumstances were against him most days. Life was unfair. But he took the unfair circumstances and it drove him to report to the base of the mountain every day. Life is unfair. There were days I bet he doubted he could make it to the top. But because he just kept going and kept reporting, he eventually got there. And there was a view that only he could see. 
church. There's a mountain with your name on it. And I don't know if you got any music you could softly play or What if I told you that there was a mountain with your name on it? What if I told you that there was land on the other side of that mountain that was just for you? Would you climb it? There would be some days you didn't think you could make it. There would be some days your legs would feel like they were going to give out. Would you still report? But the land on the other side was, value was so great that you couldn't even put a price on it. And it was all yours. All you had to do was get to the top. What if I told you that? But I'll even sweeten the deal this morning. What if I told you that every day that you got up to report to the base, there would be a guide that would meet you there? That he would be waiting on you. And that as you climbed, he would guide you. He would tell you where to, where to grab, where to step. That you would get to know the guide in the mountain so well. And you would laugh together and cry together. And there would be times where you'd come to a point where There was nowhere to grab, but all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there'd appear a place for you to hold on to, and the guide would open his mouth and put it there. What if I told you that? Would you climb? There is a mountain that's very much real. It's called your life. And on the other side of that mountain is your destiny. Could you stand this morning? Could you not look to me? Could we just maybe lift our hands to heaven? I'm not going to do a big altar call this morning. I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. I just want us to spend time with the guide today in the mountain. I just want to report to the base this morning. God, I may have my doubts, but I'm going to climb. There may be days I question everything, but I'm going to climb. I didn't get the report that I wanted, but I'm going to climb anyway. My kids aren't serving the Lord, but I'm going to climb. Finances aren't looking good, but I'm going to climb. I'm going to trust you. Because your word says you'll be with me day after day after day after day after day. To the end of the age. I want to see the view. I want to see the view. There'll be days you'll fall off the mountain and the guide will catch you and he'll put you back on it. He's a good God, ain't he? I wonder if we could just open our mouths and begin to fill this room with prayer and praise to the one, the God of the mountain. God of our life, of our destiny. There's an invitation out there for you. Are we going to be one of the many or one of the few? He'll love you every time out in the street. But there's more. 
He'll love you every time when you don't do the things you need to. We know that. But He'll appoint you and He'll commission you on the mountain after you've met Him there. I wonder if we'll meet Him there. Come on, just one more minute. Just as hard as we can. God, I'm yours. I'm going to climb no matter the circumstances, no matter how unfair it is, no matter how they treated me, no matter how they talked about me, no matter how many times they thought I was crazy. God, I will climb. I had to make a declaration to myself. There's restrictions and I can't really go into many schools right now. But God, I will get up every day and I will continue to climb until I reach the view. Come on, 30 more seconds just to seal the moment. Just to seal the moment. God, I will climb to the end of my days. I will keep going. Even if I'm the only one, I will report. God, I speak right now over Grace Point, God. We bind anxiety in the name of Jesus right now. Depression. Sickness. Apathy today, God. We bind it. The Father has given us everything we need. He's bought. He's purchased us. He's equipped us to climb. We're climbers. We're overcomers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Hallelujah. You may be seated for just a moment. Let me tell you, that's a, we've heard some powerful messages today through, through drama, through, through Brooks and, and, and what God's spoken to him. And let me just tell you something. The mountain, the mountain looks big. Life sometimes looks really big. But man, when, you, when you're equipped with the right thing, when he got the right bike, when he made that step to follow after Christ. That's what that, that's a, what that symbolizes. And all of a sudden, man, he can make it up the mountain. And he brought all his friends with him. Amen? And we, we can make it up the mountain. We can make it through life, and we can bring others with us if we'll just get equipped with the right thing, and that's our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I just encourage you to, to, to follow after him I think about the years I, you know, I've been on staff here for 25 years at this church, and I think about all the times when I wanted to stop climbing the mountain. I, there have been days that I just didn't want to climb the mountain anymore. I'm like, I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired of this. I don't want to climb anymore. I, you know. But I got up, came in, I started climbing again, and God did it. And God will do that in your life if you'll just get up and start climbing with Him once again every day. So we can't give up. We can't quit. Amen? Because quitters are losers, right? <laughs> Got that out of that message. Hallelujah. Today we've been blessed by both the Kingdom players and, and Brooks Till. And, and, and uh, Brooks is, is doing a great work um, going into the schools and helping set up clubs for for these, these students to be able to lead in their schools, doing programs at the schools to where he can minister to, to the kids. And that's, that's what it's all about. We're wanting, to get, we're wanting to get God back into the school. Amen? And as he said, what better way than to help our students start a church in school? You know, we've had such a definition of what church is supposed to be. It's a little building on a street corner somewhere that we go to. Right? But today, that's not the church. We have to be redefining. If, if, 
if COVID has taught us anything, we have to redefine what the church is because we couldn't come to the building on the corner anymore. We had to find a way to be church without going to the church. And that's what we've got to do in our society today is we've got to get out of this mindset that I, got, I just got to get them to church. No, you are the church. You got to take the church to them. And that's what Brooks is doing. And so I, I'm just so excited about us having youth alive in, in our state. And, and I know that there's going to be things coming up that he's going to partner with us to do here in our community. And he's doing it all the way across the state. And uh, we're just going to see God start little churches in schools all across our state. And so that's what I'm believing for. Amen. And that's what we're supporting him for because that's what he's out there is doing is church planning in our schools. And so uh, I just encourage you this morning as we get ready to receive offering just to give. Uh, I, now throw up that slide once again about text to give. You can text to give if you want to uh, text to this number on the screen uh, and just do the dollar sign, the amount, space, G-S, guest speaker, G-S, okay? So if you do that, Text it to us. We'll get that to them. We, we want to give them a, a great offering today and bless them, okay? Uh, so uh, we, we're not going to pass the bag. Once again, we're going to have ushers at the back of the sanctuary. If you have a check, if you have cash, drop it in there. We'll make sure that we get that to them. Uh, but can we give uh, the kingdom players another hand this morning? Appreciate you guys so much coming and ministering. Did an awesome job. Now let's give Brooks a hand this morning. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate you, my friend. Uh, Brooks is a, a good friend. I love this guy and uh, what he's doing and uh, his wonderful family as well. Just so good to have them here with us today. So uh, we're going to pray a prayer of dismissal. As you leave out, you can put money in the, in the bag that the ushers will have at the back there, or you can uh, text, go on to our app, However you can, get that money to us, and we'll get it to them. Amen? Hallelujah. Why don't we all stand once again, and let's pray a prayer. Father, I just thank you so much for what you've spoken to us today. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today that has not started that journey up the mountain, that today they'll make that decision. They can do that right now. God, to follow after you, to commit their life to you, to say, God, I need help because I can't make it up the mountain by myself. I can't, I can't do this in my own strength. And so today I want to commit my life to you. God, I pray that if there's anyone here, God, that's been struggling with just continuing up the mountain, Lord, they've just been struggling in their relationship with you. And God, just need that help today. I pray that you would just touch them. And let them know that you're there with them. That you've never left them. You've never forsaken them. And that you're right there to help them up that mountain once again. And God, for those that have faithfully been serving you over the years, just help them to stay strong in their belief and in their faith in you, O oh God. Father, I just thank you that you are always with us and that you never leave us or forsake us. Now, God, I just ask you to bless each one as they go from this place today. Bless the kingdom players, Lord God, each one of these students, Lord God. I pray your blessing upon them. God, I'm asking you to give them an anointing for the ministry that you have called them to. And God, help them to stay strong in their ministry. Lord, I pray for, for Brooks and, and Brittany. And, and God, I just ask you to just be with them and strengthen them and encourage Encourage them, God, in the calling that you have on their life. God, let them just be, do it with a passion, Lord God, that is for you. And God, see fruit like never before in their ministry. Now, Lord, I just pray your blessing upon each one as they leave this place today. Thank you for all that you've spoken to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.